Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Eric Smith, your host today for our Economic Empowerment Hour. I'm glad you are here. Thank you for taking time out of your day to really invest in yourself. Um, we're looking forward to a fantastic show. We're expecting a couple of guests to come on with me this afternoon, hopefully without any technical glitches. Uh, they'll be on and they'll be adding some extra edification and benefit to your day today. So I'd like to, uh, again, without further ado, again, Great. say welcome and thank you for being here. And we have our first guest on, Mr. Edmund Lee. Sir, how are you today? I'm doing splendidly well. How about yourself? Can you hear me and see me? I know it's taking a couple seconds to get me on here. Yes, we can see you. We hear you coming in loud and clear. So let me uh, just make sure I've got everything set up on my end as well. All right, everything is looking good. Um, ladies and gentlemen, like I said, let me give you a few housekeeping um, notes that you want to be aware of. You are on and watching what's called a Google Hangout. You may be familiar or you may not be familiar. This is awesome and exciting technology. Um, I am excited to be sharing this with you. To make this more beneficial for yourself, if you notice, you are watching this show through your Facebook page. So at the bottom of the um, screen, you're going to see the topics that we want to make sure that you get value out of today. And there are comments down at the bottom. Now, there's going to be a little delay in the comments, so if you would, start lining up your questions. Anything that you want to talk about, uh, we're hoping to have one more guest on our CPA uh, that's going to be joining us today. I'm going to just make sure that... Uh, he gets the invite. Uh, maybe I'll resend it to him again. But we want to make sure we get him on. And uh, But have your questions ready. Line your questions up in the comment section. I'll be monitoring those questions and so forth. And uh, we'll definitely try to make sure that everything is done well for you today. So with all that being said, welcome. My name again is Eric Smith. And like I said, I'm excited to really be sharing this. You know, we're talking about the topic of taxes. And the theme of our event today is how to maximize and get the most out of your tax refund. How to make it bigger. Some people need to have a big tax refund. You know, if we just really think about it today, this econo the economy, it's, it's, it sucks for some people. We're just going to keep it real. My partner Edmund Lee and I, we do a training all the time called Keeping It 100. And so we're just going to call it like it is today. And it's tough out there for some families. So what can you do to improve your family situation? What can you do to improve the future situation for your children? And there's a few questions I really want you to think about, you know, um, because it is about investing in yourself. Just like right now, you took time out of your busy day to join us. We'll be here every week. Now, we're not going to talk about this topic every week, but this show will be done every single week, the exact same time. So let your friends and family know if they want economic empowerment, get on this schedule. So just a few questions I'd like for you to consider. Um, but first, I want to just introduce, before I get into that, I want to introduce... Uh, Bill Sefton. Bill, good afternoon. How you doing? I'm doing good. I just got on the horse for the first horseback ride, and I fell off a few times. That's why I just got on board here. Well, you know, Bill, that's why we appreciate having you on this show, because your expertise is in money and finance, not technology. So we're not going to hold that against you. How's that? That's excellent. All right. Edmund Lee, you ready, sir? You got anything you, you want to say before we really get this thing cranked off? Uh, yeah, I think I can make up a couple things real quick. Um, no, seriously. Uh, first of all, before we get started, uh, welcome everybody and um, also welcome to our guests. I know the technology with Google Hangouts is uh, can be a little challenging in the beginning. Um, once again, my name is Edmund Lee and I've been uh, associated with Eric Smith or being friends with him for probably whew, three, four years at this at this point. Um, 
and the reason he created this, you know, we were actually talking about a week ago after an event, and we were talking about a way to just get more information out to the public. And we we went on, we've been on various webinars, hangouts, and different tools and everything else. And we said, all right, well, we're gonna we're gonna pick something that everybody can use that's that's doing what we're doing. And I look up maybe. Uh, you know, 12 hours after we had the conversation and looked at some things, Eric has his stuff set up. He has this hangout presented. He's got everything rolling. And uh, one thing I tell him, he's the king of implementation. And, and so he's doing this to share this with you guys. So uh, take note of everything he's saying. Eric is one of the sharpest guys. I have a very extensive background in investment and in knowledge in tax and finance. Uh, I got my master's in business, have owned and, and lost and built companies and sold them and all that type of stuff but I've learned things from him that I've never known before and it's a pleasure to be associated with him and actually be a, a mentor to him is what he calls me but I, I don't understand how but uh, he's been a mentor to me as well so guys you guys are in a in for a treat today um, from him and, and our guest speaker and so with that being said Eric I'm gonna let you go ahead and give people a bunch of value as you always do thank you very much for that kind warm introduction I really appreciate it, and that's that's my desire. If anyone has really followed my company, Smarter Money Now, the whole basis and premise of what got me started, my background is in education, uh, right out of high school, and then went into financial services, floundered around, wasn't ready for the world of entrepreneurialism, and then went into the corporate world, corporate training, different things, but I found myself back in the world of finance and advising back in 2006. 2009 I recognized basically with the economic downturn in 2008 that education, financial literacy is lacking in this country with a lot of people and so for the last past four or five years my focus has been building a financial literacy brand that can be trusted and really touching a lot of lives and that's what Smarter Money Now is all about. And so most recently, within the last year, I encountered a, a movement that is sweeping across the country. Um, funded, well, let me just put it this way, not so much funded, but at the base of it, there's a company called My Econ, which stands for My Economy, that is teaching financial success principles. And a group inside of this company has taken the bull by the reins called the Extra Digit Movement. And it's simply a group of people, three of members right here today you're looking at, an attorney, no, no, I'm sorry, not an attorney, a CPA, other successful business leaders. And really, our mission is to help people when it comes to economic empowerment, not only for themselves, but for their families and the future. And so you're going to hear about some success stories. You're going to hear some strategy. Today it's not about sales. It's all about strategy. And so we have Bill Sefton on. That's uh, Bill, how long have you been a CPA? 1967. Almost 50 years. <clears throat> almost 50 years. And through that time, I'm sure you've seen a ton of changes in the world of finance. But at the, at the center of it all, there have been some factors and principles that if people would stick to it, can families really achieve financial success in this economy? Absolutely, and I've seen it happen several times. That's amazing. So a few questions I like just to throw out here, just for you to be, if you're taking notes, ask yourself these questions. Remember to put your comments down at the bottom if there's any questions, because as we go through this today, we want to address your questions and make sure you get value. But just a quick question. If you could trade one time $179 and $29 a month for a 400% rate of return, would you do it? Think about that. If you no, could Eric, trade 100, Eric, yes sir. Before you go further, you want to really you want to learn, you want to teach them how to click that mute because in these questions we want to make sure you connect and you know that Google changes the, um, the video. I, 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 got, I got the control on that. I, I uh, just got my mouse in place so I... And now well, I just pulled out some note paper. <laughs> yeah, no, we're good, we're good, we're good. Yeah, I want you to hit and nail these questions, so go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So I think about that. If you would, could trade $179 one time and $29 a month for a 400% rate of return, 
I'm about to ask you some questions, and the reason is because today's event not only is going to teach you about maximizing your pocketbook and getting more benefit out of the tax code, we're going to challenge and stretch your thinking. So, would you trade $179 one time and $29 a month? If you could receive $100 per month extra in your take-home pay. That means would you trade $580 roughly a year to get back $1,200? Okay. Would you trade $179 one time and $29 a month in order to learn what wealthy families teach their children and have taught over the last 100 years? Do you want to stop the generational curse or create a higher financial IQ for you and your family? I mean, think about that question. If you were the smartest person in your family when it comes to money and finance, what would your family's financial situation be? And what would the legacy be? Now, depending on how you answer that question, that could be frustrating or it could be really an enjoyable answer. So that's your answer. And one other question. If you played Monopoly and never learned the rules, would you win? I mean, that's, that's a powerful question. Because today we live in a world that's called capitalism. And that's what we're here to teach and we're going to talk about. So let's get into some of these strategies about how to increase one's uh, tax refund. But I first need to ask, and this question is for Bill. Bill, a lot of people want a big tax refund, but when it comes to your finances, is that the wisest thing that a person needs to focus on? Absolutely not. The only reason why someone would want a bigger refund is because they didn't have the discipline to save what they were <clears throat> overpaying into a good investment account. Okay, so, so you're saying then a tax refund may or may not be the right thing that people need to focus on? With most people, it's the wrong thing to do. They should use that money and invest it. Okay, so when you say use that money and invest it, how? Break it down for me. What do you mean? I mean, because that's what all, that's what we've been taught all these years is to get a big refund. It's a savings plan. It's, you know, just a great tool. Why is that not the best idea? Well, if you were paying an extra $100 a month in taxes on your paycheck, and that money was being lent to the government interest-free, as it would be, and you were getting $1,200 back on April 15th, that would be a very poor investment decision. Better that you sock that $100 away into a good investment program or better education, financial education. Okay. So what he's saying is that when people get asphyxiated on the idea of a big tax refund and they fill out their W-4 on their job to have even more taken out so they can get a bigger amount, what he's saying is that that equates to giving the government a tax-free loan or an interest-free loan. I mean, think about this. If you ran a bank, would you lend money to people for their cars interest-free? And just say, just pay me back. I'm going to give you $30,000 and just give me $30,000 back over the next five, six years. Take seven if you need to and not charge anything for it. No, you, you'd go out of business. There's no way you could make money. So when we're talking about the world of capitalism, Edmund, help me to understand why is it, what are the two objectives that people basically go to work every single day and what should we really be thinking about when it comes to our financial focus? Well, that's a good question. And, and before I get to that, I'm gonna, I want to piggyback on something really quick because I know what people are thinking out there. They're saying, wow, that sounds good. Um, I can invest my money, but invest it in what? You know, what do I invest in? A lot of people think, hey, if I get an extra 100 bucks a month, I'm just going to use that for my children or to w my wife or whatever. They don't really know where to invest. So 
and just so you guys that are listening, I know that might be what you're thinking. We're going to cover not where to invest specifically because that's getting the SEC stuff, but places and money managers and things you can go to to actually learn. So we actually can help you learn how to invest that in income and you decide where to put it. So I just want you guys to know that because I don't want you to be thinking about that while we continue the um, to continue the, the hangout. So, <clears throat> but to your question though, Eric, there's two things that we all think about, whether we consciously think about it or not. Um, we're looking in, and we desire two things. One, we we desire to have enough income during our working years to pay for our lifestyle. That's why we go to work. That's why we have a business. That's why we invest. That's why we do whatever we do so that we can, you know, during our working years, we can pay for our lifestyle. That might be a thousand a month, three, four, five, ten, a hundred thousand. Just depends on you. Um, then we want our assets that we've accumulated during our working years to take care of our lifestyle when we either don't want to work anymore or we're not able to. Here's the biggest thing I get. A lot of people say, well, Ed, I love my job. I love working. I don't ever want to stop. It's a difference between loving your job and having to go to work in order to feed your family. So you can continue working until you, until God takes you from this earth, but you won't have to. And sometimes our health care can cause us to not work. So we just want to make sure that we have the income coming in, and then you can do whatever it is you want to do. Travel, spend time with your family, invest, be a philanthropist whatever that may be, or work. So it's not to say don't work. It's just to say, you know, retire from having to work. Absolutely, and that's a great point, you know, and when you think about having the funds necessary when you choose to retire, in order to continue that lifestyle, experts say, and Bill, you can confirm this also, that you need to have at minimum at least 10 times more than what your annual salary is now. So if your salary is 50000 then you need to have an investment account that has at least 500000 or more so that you can continue your lifestyle when you retire so that it continues to spit out the 50000 you need. Now, there are a few other little factors you want to plan for, such as inflation, which we're going to get into in a bit, but you need to have that as a minimum so that you can retire. The challenge is most people are not getting the 10 times amount set aside so that they can retire. I mean, Bill, before I get into some of the reasons why people aren't doing that, you have anything else you want to add to that? No, you're right on. The question is how do we raise that $500,000? We're working 15 hours a day, seven days a week sometimes. And that's that's a great point and so this is what we're going to talk about next you want to write these down get your pen and paper and write these four points down these are the four obstacles that prevent people from achieving the two goals that Edmund pointed out that we all go to work to achieve every single day the first one we call is the silent income killer of limited income slash inflation so you want to write that down, limited income and inflation. When we talk about limited income and inflation, I mean, if you look back 10 years ago, you may have been making 20 bucks an hour on a job, 15, 20 bucks, and if you're making 30 to 40 bucks an hour, do you know that your spending ability, if you really think about it, is equal to what you were making back then? Because inflation eats into your buying power. I mean, Edmund, give me an example of how inflation is affecting everybody every single day. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> um, I could talk to you about gas. Um, <laughs> that, that, that's a loan right there. Everybody feels that pain. Uh, I remember back when I was in high school, and that was probably, and I'm only 32, uh, gas was like 99 cents. And I had a Honda Accord, I remember it, a little 88 Honda, um, and uh, I could put $15 in it and drive for at least a month. Uh, now, $15 in, in my car now, it, it, it would, the needle won't even move. It'll just kind of probably laugh at me. Um, so that's one that you guys can feel. I mean, think about when you filled your tank up the last time you filled it up. It's never really a warm and fuzzy feeling, but inflation... <laughs> 
is that increase that's going to continue, guys. Do you know, I think in like the 50s or 40s, you could buy a Corvette for like $13,000. I mean, that's amazing to hear that. But now you're looking at, I mean, I don't know, I don't know what they cost, but it's definitely not 12000 So that inflation will keep going. It's kind of like having a, a, a funnel with a hole in it. You know, it, it's, that's basically what it is when you're investing somewhere that's not investing past inflation. So when you got inflation that's eating at you, I mean, think about it, folks. Daycare is up. Food is up. Gas is up. Rent is up. Everything is up. But what about your paycheck? Did your boss come in and say, Bill, man, I know it's expensive for you to get to work every day. We're going to give you a little bonus just to help you out with some of the gas fees. I mean... Does that happen with employers? No, that doesn't happen with employers. So the only people today that are inflation-proof are business owners. Here's an example. Let's say you own a grocery store. Well, the farmer that grows the produce, he grows the produce, and then the trucking company comes and takes his stuff to the market, sells it for him or whatever, how that happens. But the trucking company has a surcharge and and fuel because fuel prices are so high. So they charge the farmer a little bit more to take whatever they need to take for him or the farmers, the fuel cost running his tractors makes him raise the prices of his product. So he passes it on to the next person. When the grocery store gets it, who pays the ultimate price for how much the produce costs? Not the grocery store owner because they just simply raise their prices even more. It's the consumer. But who's not getting the raise? It's the consumer. So inflation is eating at the back pocket of people. So then the second thing you Actually, want to write down. Eric, Eric, let me add to that really quick. We've never shared this on any of our hangouts, but I want to bring this up. Because you just brought up an interesting point when you talk about the consumer and the worker, right? So the worker has to pay for the, at the pump. They pay the sales tax. They pay their own income tax. But check this out. If you guys really want to be a nerd like I am, you can look at the 2013 W-4. If you look at a 2013 W-4 and compare it to a 2012, you will see that the increases are slightly happening even on your W-4. Slowly, you don't even see it. It's increasing how much that they take out of your pay and how much it, how much it takes for you to qualify for different exemptions. You may not understand that right now, but that's something we can teach you. But that's something that if you don't change your W-4, it's just constantly eating at you, and you're and it's coming when you don't even know it. Plus, you feel it at the pump. So um, that might have thrown you guys off a little bit, but I just want you to know inflation happens in so many different places, and it's slow. Even stamps go up. You know, those types of little things creep up and creep up, and that takes away from your from your from your buying power. Absolutely. Well, that's that's an incredible point. Thank you very much. I mean, you're right. It, everything is getting more and more expensive. And so when you talk about taxes and you talk about that W-4 withholding form, we're moving into the section of our conversation that becomes very important. And this is what we really want you to dial into. The second thing that affects people from achieving the two goals that they initially set out to leave their house every single day, leaving their babies, putting their babies in daycare, whatever, to get their, take care of their lifestyle today and take care of the lifestyle tomorrow, taxes. Taxes? Wow. Taxes. That's all I'm going to say. I mean, when you get your paycheck and you, you work and made a big bonus, and, and this is where Bill is going to talk to us, about taxes a little bit and then we're going to go move on to the third point but taxes can eat up to bill how much can taxes a percentage of a person's income on an annual basis will taxes eat up I've seen it be as much as uh, 45 percent out here in California you take a 35 percent federal tax bracket and you add on to that about a California 10 percent tax bracket you got 45 percent that means for every if you want to Let's put this in a really, really clean example. If you want $1,000 to go to Disney World, you have to make $1,500. No, you have to make $2,000 to have $1,000 to pay the taxes to have $1,000 left over to make the trip. 
You follow me? Absolutely. So you need a thousand dollars to go to Disney World. You need to make two thousand dollars in overtime or somehow, because you're going to take a thousand dollars out of your paycheck. That'll leave you the thousand dollars to take your trip. So, you know, in our examples, because I live in Oklahoma, so you're making me second think of. Second, second guess myself about moving to San Diego with 35% federal and 10% state. Oh, no, you stay in Oklahoma. Man, I'm paying $500 a month for electricity and gas. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for that information, folks. Those of you that are out in California, you may understand what Bill's talking about. I think I'll count my blessings here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in my house. <laughs> you know, I've put my house out in California to probably sell for a million, but it's a hundred thousand here, so I, I'm good. I, I'm happy about that. So how big is your home? Um, right around two thousand square foot. Mine's two thousand square foot. How much are you paying for electricity and gas? Uh, you know, about seventy bucks a month. Seventy-five. I'm paying almost five hundred. <laughs> well, four dollars for gasoline for the car. Now we're not. We're going to get into this a little bit, but Bill, are you really paying that? Or are you writing off a percentage of that? Well, if you have a moment, I've got a great story to tell you. <laughs> so we'll save that story because I'm sure we're going to get into that a little bit later because, folks, we're going to bring a solution. We're talking about the problems. Oh, we're absolutely. Talking the, we're talking about solutions here. Yeah. Well, we're going to get, we're going to get into those solutions. But uh, just want to point out something. When we talk about taxes, taxes eating for the average family across this country – that may not experience, because you may live in uh, Florida and Texas, and you may not experience 45% like you might in California, but the average family in the U.S. is going to lose 30 to 35% in taxes in their paycheck. What that really equates to is basically you working for the IRS or the federal government from January through April. Yep. January, February, March, April to pay your taxes. Now consider this. Would you take a job if they said, Bill, Edmund, you're hired, but you're not going to get your first paycheck till May 1st? Would you take that job? Would either one of you fellas take that job? Absolutely not. <laughs> no. I wouldn't take a job, period, but definitely not that. Amen. I hear you. So, so what I'm talking about is Nobody in their right conscience mind would do that, but the effect is the same thing that every pay period, if you're losing a third, it's like working from January, February, March, April. And so because taxes take that much out of people's life, really taxes can be part of the blame for the next problem, which is number three. Write this down. Debt. When you lose a third, up to 45% of your income to taxes, who do you know can really live on 55 to 65% of their income at this stage when they have children, cars, houses? That means you have to go borrow to make up the difference. And so that means now that you're enslaved to the banks, you're working from May, June, July, August to take care of the interest and the fees to the banks. So when do you have money left for you? I mean, Bill, you work with clients. What kind of struggle and complaints do you hear your clients talk about, you know, high taxes and how it affects them and so forth? You know, honestly, I don't think very many people realize that. We're in a Burger King economy where people don't decide what they're going to have for dinner until they drive home at night and pass Burger King. People are not thinking. They're paralyzed. They are just totally oblivious to how much money is getting wasted and evaporating out of their pocket. That's a We've great got to point. educate them. Well, that's a great point, and, and that's why we're having this type of event because – most people have just been accustomed to getting a tax refund so long, the bigger the better. And I had a conversation with a young lady uh, earlier, and, and I, 
I'm very proud when people feel comfortable to just admit their thoughts around tax refunds. She said it's a savings program. And, you know, I can't do it. I can't handle it any different. And, Bill, you said it earlier how sometimes we just don't have the discipline. But you know what? I think it's a lack of education sometimes as to what people could be doing. And so as we get into some of the solutions, we're going to share with you how to increase your paycheck and what you could be doing with that increasing your paycheck every single month. So the fourth thing that you want to write down is less than ideal cash flow decisions. I mean, if everything is up, the government and got their money. If you work a W-2 job, the government gets their money first. Then you got to go pay your bills. You don't get to enjoy your money till later. That could affect you emotionally, and you can start making some decisions. And we call those less than ideal cash flow decisions. And what happens here is that because the lack of money, it can create a situation where if you get paid on the uh, fifth but your bills are due on the first, then late fees start kicking in, other issues start kicking in, and if you just start adding up your late fees every single month, all year long, that can total a lot of money that people could be losing. Another way, and Bill, you could be thinking about an example too, but another way I call a less than ideal cash flow decision is when people go to ATMs that aren't with their bank and pay a fee to get their own money or another less than ideal cash flow decision this time of the year bill people are doing to get their taxes back real fast what do they pay refund uh, fee well I, what I was specifically Refund's talking zero? about the uh, you know rapid refund or rapid returns yes. and so forth yeah Paying a so fee to get the refund today and waiting for the government to send the bank the money. Repeat that fee. What did you call that fee? It's a fee that uh, some uh, CPAs and tax preparers charge to allow you to get a, a, a loan against your refund. So you get your money today, and then that loan is paid off when the refund actually arrives. So you've redirected the, the, the refund to the lending company. You follow me? I follow you. Refund but participation fee, I think it's called. Refund participation fee. And they basically they charging you to get your own money. That's a less than ideal cash flow decision because where does the tax refund come from itself, Bill? Comes from me. I had it withheld in my paycheck. My money. And the government's had it all this time. There was, a, uh, there was a bulletin that came out in 2009, 2005 that the IRS talks about the tax refund and where it comes from. And it comes from when you send money in or you tell your employer how much to withhold from your paycheck. And at that point in time, you've given, you've given them permission to take this money and how much. And then when you file your taxes... These were your uh, deductions and so forth, and then if that amount is less than what you sent in, then you're due a refund. So you're being sent your own money back, and the IRS on this bulletin said the IRS does not pay interest on this money. So when Bill talks about an interest-free loan to the government and why I was talking earlier about if you had a bank, that's why. Now, if you are the type of person that says, I don't care what anybody says, I want a big refund. I don't care. Well, guess what? Today's your day because we're still going to help you with that information. But if this information has been resonating with you and you're looking for, okay, so now that I understand maybe it's not the best idea to have a big refund, what can I do? Let's talk about three solutions. And this is, the, this is a crazy part. I mean, buckle up, folks, because... Solution number one, what we teach in the movement of the Extra Digit Movement and my econ is we teach you to minimize taxes and reduce expenses. 
Bill, what's one of the most interesting and effective, easy ways to minimize taxes? To minimize taxes, having your own home-based business. Tell us a little bit more benefit about that. Well, most people can't write off their internet connection or their computers or their laptops or their iPads or all the other technology you see people using in the coffee shops around the country. But you and I are here working a business where we're able to write off all of our computer, internet, and other related expenses. So going back to my example, if I'm spending $1,000 a month on internet connection, if I don't have a business, I'm going to have to make up towards the $2,000 to have the taxes to pay to have the $1,000 left over to pay for the internet connection. But if it's a write-off in my business, it's a direct offset, and there's a zero tax sum game there. So and it might be that my business might make the $1,000 to pay for it, and so I'm $1,000 ahead. Absolutely. So this is a great time, folks. Again, if you would, in the comments section, scroll down below the screen while you're watching us. I know you're enjoying watching Bill and I, but you want to throw any questions or comments that you have in the bottom, and then I'll be monitoring those so that we can answer those questions as we go through the rest of our, uh, our time together, because we want to make sure you get crazy value out of this day. One of the first things, when you set up a home business, once you do that, it's very important that you read the form that the IRS has you fill out when you get a job. That form says, it's called the W-4 form, by the way. <coughs> Never read that form. At the top of it, the purpose, inside of that, it says you might want to consider filling this form out once a year or when your financial situation changes. Bill, when a person starts a home-based business, does their financial situation change? Dramatically. Do you have any kind of stories, uh, success stories of people and what happened with their taxes uh, once they started a home-based business? Oh my goodness. Which one do I pick? The most exciting one. Well, a young fellow who um, was divorced with two young, young boys. He had never traveled anywhere in his life. He got involved in a home-based business and because of the extra tax refund he got because of it, and this was like 30-some years ago, he was able to uh, go to a continuing education class in Hilo, Hawaii, in California. First time he had traveled out of the country, or out of the mainland, Okay. just because he had a home-based business and he was working it. Absolutely. So when you start a home-based business, one of the first things we teach inside of the Extra Digit Movement and My Econ is that you want to go and correct your W-4. And just for joining us on the, the Hangout today, if you would scroll down to the bottom of below, there's a tab that's set up for you that's called Bonus W-4 Training. There is a training that was done that explains and breaks down line by line how to correct your W-4 and how to maximize the W-4. So you definitely want to click on that and uh, enjoy that uh, video training. So when you correct your W-4, that allows you then to start putting more money back into your take-home pay. We have people inside of this movement that have put anywhere from three to seven, eight hundred thousand dollars a month back into their take-home pay, and this would be, this is a lot of times. It's just simply the money you were getting in a refund without having a home business. I mean, because a lot of folks are getting refunds without a home business. If you take that refund amount divided by 12, that means each month you're overpaying your taxes by that amount. And so when you can put three to four, five hundred dollars a month back into your paycheck, you could use this money to start a debt elimination program. We've got software that we share with you that comes with our system. By the way, we offer a system in MyEcon that allows you to set up and start a home-based business, 
It's 179 bucks. It's 29 dollars a month. That gives you the ability to turn around and put back into your paycheck anywhere from three to five, six hundred dollars per month. And this one hundred and seventy-nine dollars bill, when a person starts a home business and they pay one hundred and seventy-nine dollars and twenty-nine a month, do they get to write that off their taxes? Absolutely. So writing that off your taxes then um, is really important. So early I asked you, would you trade 179 one time to be able to write off money or get back $100 per month? That's a that's a no-brainer trade in. So you definitely want to those there are a lot of people that are involved in this movement that may have directed you to this video. You most definitely want to get back with the person that uh, has been educating you about this information, and that relationship and get started working with them so that they can help you correct your W-4, view the video that's been done, the training. Because st strategy number one is reducing taxes. So correcting the W-4 is huge. Then you can start a debt elimination program. But then when you set up that home-based business, Bill, let's talk about these deductions in a little bit more detail um, that a person can take and how they could take some of these deductions when they have a home-based business. I mean. Generally, we talk about eight common deductions, but uh, talk to me about vehicle expenses, transportation deductions, home deductions, etc. Well, the big thing to keep in mind is, is there a business purpose to whatever you're spending the money on? The, the primary thing you need to do is have a business purpose for doing it. Now, you want to have a, if, it, if it's kind of iffy, then you want to make sure that the uh, you have good documentation on it. The reason why you did something. Uh, if I flash back to some 30 years ago, when an IRS auditor complained about the trip that a young fellow took from San Jose to Texas to see his brother, and he didn't have much of an Amway business at that time, but the plane the plane fare was pretty expensive. And I said, yeah, I understand, sir, why you have a problem with that deduction. But what you don't understand is that he and his brother do not get along very well, but he knew his brother would be a really good promoter. So the deduction was allowed. So if the business purpose is there for do doing that expense, then it's deductible. I had another example of a fellow who uh, was going to go to Disney World to a Toastmasters convention. I said, how much, how are you going to pay for it? He said, I'm going to take it out of my IRA. I said, well, you're going to have to take $3,000 out of your IRA to have $1,000 to pay the taxes to have the $2,000 to go. Now, if you're in a networking kind of business where you're sharing ideas back and forth, what better group to be with than those masters at their annual convention in Orlando at Disney World? And so in that case, his two thousand dollar expense would be offset would offset this two thousand dollar IRA and he wouldn't have to pay the thousand dollars in taxes. You follow me? Wow. So it's really in how you structure the deduction and how you structure your life. You know when you I actually got a question before? here. Go ahead, Edmund, you got a question? Yeah, so a lot of people ask me, they say, Ed, um, what is it that I have to do to say I have a home-based business, to say I uh, be a part of something that has a uh, uh, independent consulting or something like what we do with sharing the strategy, people say, "Well, that's not a business." They're thinking a store, or they're thinking, you know, going getting the EIN or something. Tell them how they can just attach to a business that has a networking branch to it. One, and then two, what does it take for them to qualify from IRS standards as a person that's working? and can get write-offs because people change their W-4 and they're like, hey, I want to make sure that I can prove that I'm actually working a business. How do I How do I do those two things? That's easy. Who wants to answer that? Go ahead. I'll let you answer since you're the most qualified. <laughs> well, you have a good old uh, journal that says who you talk to, when you talk to them, basically what you talked about. Okay? So if you only talk to a to a prospect about your business activity once a year, 
that's not a business. But if you're making sure that you're circulating with a lot of different people and you're keeping notes and collecting business cards and just chatting, not hammering people, not selling them, but connecting with people and seeing if there's some prospects out there, that's, uh, that's the biggest part. The other one is you keep your accounting records separate from your personal life. In other words, you have a personal checking account that's devoted to your business as opposed to mixing all your business expenses in with all your personal expenses. You dedicate a credit card to your business and you don't mix up personal stuff in the, in the, in the business credit card. It doesn't have to be identified with the bank as a business credit card. It just has to be separated for you. You have to have, a, uh, have business cards. Okay, you have to act like you're in business, and for the most important than anything else, you have to own your own product. Okay, I had a fellow up in the Dallas, Oregon, once who owned a Arco station and a Union 76 station, and he happened to be in his Union 76 station with his Arco uniform one, and the regional vice president for Union 76 drove through, and he immediately was fired and lost his station. No, you got to walk the talk. Okay, so in this case, you don't necessarily, you don't have to own my econ. You just become an independent, you know, representative. So that's what he means by owning your own product, guys. You don't. It doesn't mean you have to create the product. What he means is no. you are the branch. You're the information that's sharing. And yeah. I want you to talk about this. If the person says, "Hey, I don't want to talk to people, but I'll market. I'll use social media," because some companies don't do direct conversation. They just market. So what if they can prove, hey, I'm marketing my business, I'm doing presentations, I'm doing hangouts, webinars, etc. Would that classify from the IRS standpoint? And I know a lot of people that are on this earth that are uh, tax professionals. Yes, we know that you have to be in, in business with an intent to make a profit. You don't have to make a profit, but you do have to be in business with the intent to do that. And then you have to actually work, I think it's the three to four hours a week on average within your business. But that's a part of your lifestyle when you're a home-based business owner and you're actually doing this as a you know, regular conversation and also marketing. Being on this call right now constitutes one hour of you working on your business from an education standpoint. So can you talk to the people about that as far as um, you know, if, if they're marketing, is that considered in IRS terms uh, effectively promoting and marketing your business? Oh yes, absolutely. You just have to uh, have some sort of document documentation to show that that's what you've been doing. You have a you have a calendar like the one you had that said it. Okay, at twelve o'clock Pacific time, I had to be on this webinar, right? And so when you go into the IRS audit, then you can show that all of this activity you did to work your business, including this little webinar. Okay. Right. Conference calls, events, seminars. Anything that's business related. Got it. Okay. Meals. I, do, I believe that you don't have to be in somebody's face to be promoting. You just have to throw out a question that causes conversation that may lead into a business conversation. And that's right. a that's a business tax deductible event. Awesome. So just posting questions on Facebook about your business is can be marketing. Absolutely. Now we're running kind of running low on time, so I want to show a little uh, metaphor here, if I may. Have a rubber band. Can you all see this? Yep. Now there's no bigger waste of time or money than to go through an IRS audit. Okay. I think we can all agree to that. <laughs> IRS auditors do not make good prospects because they're not normally very sociable. <laughs> okay. okay. Nothing against them. We CPAs aren't very sociable normally either. But most people's rubber bands are just doing nothing. They're just sitting here, okay? That's like your W-4 where you're getting a, a big tax refund on April 15th, okay? You just got this wimpy, limpy rubber band doing nothing. Now, if you stretch the rubber band a little bit and, know, and get educated about money and finances and taxes, it, the, the rubber band can be useful. The tax law can be useful. Now, you never want to stretch it so far that it ends up breaking and you end up spending a whole lot, this is a good rubber band, <laughs> it ends up breaking and knocking your eye out. So you want to be sensible in the deductions that you take, okay? The obvious ones, internet connection, 
about getting promoting and, and networking with individuals and getting out in the public. But you don't want to get go to the extremes and take things that might seem fun but get you into trouble. You know, one of the deductions that I like talking about, Bill, is one that I think a major majority of the American population loses out on because if they don't have a home business, they can't take advantage of it. But then those that do have a home business, and that is hiring your children as employees of your home business. Can you talk, can you talk about that a bit. We got some extra time here. We got a we got just a little bit of time. Give me a give me a sixty second version of. Uh, oh, you want a sixty second version? I was at a networking event the other day, and I ran out of business cards. And I'm pulling out this business card. I don't know if you can see it very well, but you know now how it's printed not too too square. Yeah, that's not square. That's not square. It looks pretty bad, doesn't it? So I said, I only have five more business cards left. I've already given out 50 at this networking event where everybody was passing out business cards. What do I do with these five? I can't use these. These look terrible. And then I thought, college planning. So now when I handed somebody the business card, I says to them, I says, this is my college planning card. And they look at me kind of funny because nothing on there says college planning. I said, yeah, I hire my grandson, $100 a week to do all my social media and my printing and business cards and other routine office duties. We put that away in his Roth IRA, and when he's 18, he'll have $6,000 a month income tax-free for higher education expense. <laughs> wow. All because of a business card that didn't print out very nice. So you're, you're talking about hiring your grandson, too. Not, well, yeah, I mean, look at my age. I don't have any sons that are. <laughs> I mean, you could be my son. So you could be my grandson, maybe. So this this particular deduction, I mean, the personal exemption that every person in the U.S. Uh, this year, what is that? What is the exemption for this year that will apply for next tax year, Bill? My wife's knocking on my atrium uh -oh. window like I mean, she needs me for something. Okay. <laughs> she doesn't what, know that I'm talking internationally. Oh, okay. Well, that personal exemption last year was $6,100 per person. That means Thank everyone you. everyone in America can make $6,100 per person, including your children. And reasonable age, six, seven-year-olds that can carry out little bitty assignments, cleaning the office, picking up, getting ready to have a meeting in your home, or whatever. Uh, I was talking to another CPA friend of mine. Some of you may have seen the uh, Google Hangout I've done that uh, the CPA was talking about he hires his eight-year-old daughter. She's his paper-shredding queen. So Bill mentioned hiring his grandson, 100 bucks a week, pay your child up to $6,000 per year, depending on their age. you got to be reasonable. And, and talk to your tax preparer you know, about that. Work something that's reasonable out. But put let that money add, to let me, Eric, let me add something to that. Please. Uh, disclaimer here. I don't have a grandson. It was an example. It was a story. Um, but uh, the other thing you want to have is really good documentation. The grandson has to be working and performing work, and you do have to file a tax return because there will be self-employment tax of about 15% owed on that money that he earns. But when he puts it in a Roth IRA, the advantages later on can be incredible. Well, but now, you got to do it right. But let me ask you a question. Does he pay 15% self-employment if he's not paid over $6,000? Yes. It starts at six hundred dollars, but that's it, nothing. It starts at how much? Six hundred. Six hundred. That's that's nothing compared to the advantages you get. Okay. So if that money was invested properly, um, the parent could use that money as a write-off, but then um, the child, you put that into an investment account, and then you get the to deduct name. It. But you get to deduct that from the taxes, correct? Then once you're putting it the into the parent deducts the money when it goes into the child's checking account. And then if the child's checking account is putting it into an investment account, then they get to deduct it again, right? If it's a pre-tax account. Well, yeah, but they can put it in a Roth IRA, and then when they go to college, they can have that money income tax free. They can have it income tax free. So you've got options there as oh, far yeah. as what can be done. 
So I was talking to a, uh, a, a single mom in uh, San Antonio, and her daughter's in private school that costs $550 a month. She just got started in her home business with working with the Extra Digit Movement and my econ. And I said, well, put your daughter to work managing your social media, write that expense off, and pay for her school out of the daughter's checking account. Was that good advice that I shared with her, Bill? Only than that, I would have said, "Now have your daughter pay for her own schooling." Well, that's what I—that's what I was saying. Which is, the same, which is saying the same thing, but a little bit more precise. So, what he's saying yeah, there is teach the responsibility when you when you do it that way. Say that one more time. I said, and you teach a responsibility when you do it that way. Have them actually involved in the process, understand it, and they're actually paying, but they know why and where it's coming from because they would then. Know so even if they don't fully understand it, they, they'll learn it by application. Excellent. Beautiful. So that's strategy number two. Strategy number three, once you have freed up this money from your paycheck, you've eliminated debt. By the way, we give you software in this 179. If you're interested, please get back with the person that, like I said, directed you to this video. Uh, get back with whoever's coaching that you feel comfortable with learning these strategies from. You eliminate the debt. You set up the business. Now you can create business income, which can then go into successful investing. Now you've got monies put being put aside to where you can now finally start achieving the financial goals, but you still have your job. See, this conversation that we have and what we talk about in this movement, you will never hear us say, uh, quit your job. Start a home-based business, get involved in something. You can make so much money and fire your boss and all of that. No, this is not what it's about. Three sources of income. Um, actually, we're going to help you create five sources of income. We're going to help you increase your take-home pay, create business income. We're going to help you also create uh, investment income. And, and when you start putting putting this together, it starts to make for a very, very successful financial future. Bill, any, any other thoughts and comments before I close this out? No, but thank you. This is the first time I've ever done this, so if I haven't looked at the camera, I apologize. I keep looking at your face, which is about six inches below the camera. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it happens to me sometimes that I've done Hangouts for over a year. I get used to looking at the screen, but we appreciate your financial expertise, not your technical expertise, Bill. We really appreciate you getting on today. And again, everyone that took time out of their schedule, we want to make sure this was a powerful hour for you so that you can be more confident in making decisions. We want to give you enough information to wake you up to say, I need to be thinking about doing something different. So if you want more information, follow back up with me, follow back up with the person that uh, sent you uh, to this video. We thank you for doing this. Take advantage of the W-4 bonus training and if you like this technology, if you're a business owner and you are a, you've got clients, there's a button down there that says steal this. Learn about this technology that we're doing this hangout through. This is the first time that I've used it and I hope it has worked well as far as uh, ease of you being able to get to the hangout and so forth. This is incredible technology. You're watching it right inside of your Facebook. This is great. So if you're a business owner, grab this information. This is Eric Smith saying thank you for being here. Bill, thank you very much. Thank Ed you. had to jump off, so we want to make sure he's acknowledged on this. Thank him. And we'll see you guys next week. Same time, same place, different topic, but it's all about your financial future.